Good morning. <laughs> We're going to begin with uh, a prayer. If Cecilia, is Cecilia there? Yes, she is, right. I'd like us to pray. This is the prayer from Our Lady of All Nations, the Lady of All Nations, and I think it's very appropriate for this topic. So let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the whole Spirit live in our hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disaster, and war. May the Lady of all nations, who once was Mary, be our advocate. Amen. Since being given this topic of Mary Most Holy, the highly favoured daughter of the Father, I've written and rewritten it many times. And then I came along here to the convention yesterday to hear Father Stan give most of the talk. And then Sherry Waddell chopped a bit more out of it. <laughs> and then, of course, bishops have to have their say. And Bishop D'Souza did the rest. <laughs> so, so I thought to myself, what do I do now? Maybe they'll forget what they've said by Sunday morning. But then I began to think, what's the Holy Spirit doing here? There seems to be a consistent theme running through the addresses that are being presented this convention. And so there is obviously a message for us to take to hear, to take to heart and to put into practice. And so I resisted the desire to rush home last night and sort of rewrite everything. However, I did edit it a little bit. I'd like to begin by quoting someone who's been quoted very often during the convention, that's Pope John Paul II. He says that there are two commitments that should characterize this third and final preparatory year as we build up to the great jubilee of the year 2000. The first of these commitments is the meeting of the challenge of secularism. And the second is a dialogue with the great religions. With regard to the former, the Holy Father says, that's the meeting of the challenge of secularism, the Holy Father says that we need to broach this vast subject of the crisis of civilization, which has become so apparent in recent years in the West, which although it's being highly developed at a te technological level, the West, the, P the Pope says, is interiorly impoverished by its tendency to forget God and to keep him, keep him at a distance. He goes on to say that this crisis of civilization must be countered by a civilization of love, a civilization founded on the universal values of peace, solidarity, justice, and liberty. All of these, he says, find their fulfillment in Christ. The Pope is not talking specifically about some crisis of faith in the church. He's referring rather to a much broader worldwide crisis, the challenge of secularism and its growth in society. And of course, secularism must impact upon the church because we're all members of society. We don't live in isolation from society and almost without our knowing it, the influence of secularism is having an impact on us and unfortunately too often 
on our spiritual lives. It's not a new challenge for the church. The whole of this blood-splattered 20th century has seen the development of secularism almost like an uncontrollable social cancer. It's been attacking every aspect of civilization. We know it. We've experienced it in our own families. It's attacked marriage and family life, sexuality, the respect for life, education, religion, and even the environment. They've all succumbed in part to this perversive and pervasive malignancy. And often we look at society and wonder if it's still the same society that we knew. The church has always had the power to meet these challenges in the past, but there's a new twist to the challenge of secularism. Never before has the church had to work in a civilization that is totally secular. Paganism? Yes, there's always been paganism. Heresy? It's part of the bread and butter of life in the church. But secularism is something new, and this is the new challenge that we as the church and our leaders must lead us through as we face the third millennium. And it's against this backdrop of these broad perspectives of our commitment to challenge and meet the challenge of secularism and dialogue with the great world faiths that the Holy Father introduces Mary as Mary Most Holy, the highly favoured daughter of the Father. It's in this context that he speaks of her. And he says that she will appear before the eyes of the believers as the perfect model of love towards both God and man. That Mary will appear in this time, in this age, as we face these challenges, as the perfect model of love, of both of love of God and of neighbor. And she will come with a loving and urgent invitation for all the children of God, not just the church, but for all the children of God. And that is why we have this picture of Our Lady of All Nations, the Lady of All Nations as a backdrop. And if you can see, Cecilia, if you could lift it up just a little. Can you see the sheep at the bottom? You see the sheep around the world. Yes, all the sheep, all the little sheep, and there are some black ones in there too. <laughs> so that should make us all feel comfortable that we've got a place. That all the children of God, at the invitation and loving and an urgent invitation of Mary, are being called to return to the Father's house. It's almost as though, through Our Lady, God is saying to the whole world, it's time to come home. Come home. You've wandered too far away. You're hurting yourselves. Come home. Listen to your mother. And the message of Mary is, do whatever Christ tells you. Let's look for a moment at what secularism is doing in the world. Some years ago, I had to work with a young man who, though he was emotionally and psychologically damaged, he was intellectually gifted and very perceptive for his years. And part of the therapy was to walk with him. And often on these walks, he would say, Rory, Western civilization is dead. It's dead. It's dead. It's dead. What are we going to do? 
In like vein, the Holy Father is saying to us at this time as we approach the third millennium that the civilization in the West is chronically ill. It is in serious crisis. Even though we now have such incredible technological development. But it is the interior impoverishment that is the crisis of the West. And this impoverishment has come, or this technology has come at the cost and the price of our spiritual impoverishment. For we have forgotten God. Our society tends to forget God and keeps him at a distance. And this is secularism in its essence. And secularism is atheistic. We're dealing with atheism when we deal with secularism. Secularism tries to explain, as Father Stan said yesterday, explain everything in terms of this world. We come from nowhere, we're going nowhere, we're here now, let's make the best of it. There's nothing after this. We're the creators of our own world, the masters of our own destiny. The seeds of this awful state were planted about well, three or four centuries ago in the 17th century when the philosophy of subjectivism was introduced for the first time into human history. And this philosophy places the individual, makes of us, ourselves, the undisputed center of our own universe. We create everything for ourselves. And since this philosophy has been part of Western thought, it's tended to become the underpinning philosophy for all the theories and systems of our education. And I think it's interesting to note that here in New Zealand, when the Education Act was passed last century, education was to be secular. So for a long time in New Zealand, we have had this social cancer educating our people. Until the West was infected with this philosophy of subjectivism, it was quite clear-headed. But since then, our, our thinking in general has become more and more scrambled and confused. But that was only round one. There came a round two with Darwin and his theory of evolution by natural selection. And this was coupled up with an attempt to establish scientifically the age of the earth and the universe. And together, this theory of evolution with the attempt to put an age on the universe, reduced the traditional creating supreme spirit, whom we call God, to a religious irrelevancy. A spiritual crutch for we who are, they would think, religiously disadvantaged. For Darwin's theory doesn't need God. And the sad irony is that Darwin started off as a believer and through his research became an atheist. As an individual, as a person I can remember back 45 years or so, and if I grow older, I'll add a few more years to that memory. But I'll never go back beyond my memory, unless, of course, I'm surrounded by other people who can go back further. And little by little, we can push back our common understanding and experience of history. But that's the purpose of history, to try and give us a perception of what our memories cannot bring to mind. 
now we're on the, the very eve of the 2000th anniversary of Christianity. And without the literary inheritance that Christians down through the ages has given to us, we would find it very difficult even to understand what one or two thousand years of history is about. But the purveyors of secularism confidently want all of us to learn to think and talk in terms not of just hundreds of years and in thousands of years, but in tens and hundreds and thousands of million years. And to go, ooh and ah, isn't this fantastic? Hasn't science opened up such amazing knowledge for humans? But the numbers are too big. We can't compute. We can't understand these numbers. They are so big, they are so incredible that they're of no value, they're useless. I remember a few years ago, a TV documentary on the Shah of Persia, and he was showing the interviewer around his royal palace. And as he did so, they came to the throne room and the interviewer said to him, what is it like to be seated on the most valuable throne, the most priceless throne in the world? And he said, exactly, priceless. It's valueless. Who can buy it? It's solid gold. It's encrusted, look here, with diamonds and rubies and sapphires, emeralds, etc." And he said, furthermore, it's very uncomfortable to sit on. <laughs> <laughs> and his people must have heard that because very soon they chucked him off it. <laughs> you know, where is the common sense in presenting information about the world that we just can't get our heads around? It's not because we're stupid that we can't understand it. It's just simply the information is invalid. It's too big. It's irrelevant. We don't need to know about hundreds of millions of years. We don't know what that means. We have no way of measuring it. And yet daily we continue to be bombarded by science and numbers and statistics, unspellable and impronounceable words, theories and counter theories. But what is the real issue? What's the real agenda in all of this? The main casualty of secularism is God the Creator, who is pushed further and further and further back into the distance until the very Creator of everything becomes irrelevant. If we can't think back hundreds of millions of years to the beginning, then what's the, you know, is there anything beyond that? God is the great casualty of secularism. And if the God question must be asked by religious fanatics, then the secularists will only give it the status of being some sort of energy or cosmic force. Nothing more. Certainly not the personal God who has created and redeemed us because he loves us and wants to share himself with us. For that's what love does, as the bishop said last night. It shares itself. And so secularism robs us and removes from the world the first great commandment. Love God with your whole heart and your whole soul and your whole strength. This is the great crisis for our civilization, the Holy Father says. It seems that secularism works on the basis that if you tell a big enough lie, then people will believe it. 
but then we know who the father of lies is. Secularism has robbed us or tries to rob us of our patrimony of God in general, of our Lord Jesus Christ specifically, and of the church in particular. They all become irrelevant. Thank God the Vicar of Christ has always got his finger on the pulse. And he says that no, it is the task of the church, of us who are the guardians of truth, to stand up and to challenge the purveyor of lies, just as the Vicar of Christ warned the first church in his first letter, be calm but vigilant because your enemy the devil is prowling round like a roaring lion looking for someone to eat. Stand up to him, strong in faith. It's important that we're off his menu. But secularism doesn't stop there. Having tried to remove God from our thought, our society, our way of life, it then turns its attack upon ourselves, on us, on individual people. For it tries to rob us of ourselves, of our own inner being, of our personality, of our soul, of our spirit. It just simply ignores the historical human experience that we are spiritual beings. It just ignores it. And it offers us an incredible freedom, a frightening freedom. It argues this. Since there is no God, there is no need for God, no need for the spirit, no human spirit, then there is no sin. No sin. We're free. We can do what we like. Nothing is right and nothing is wrong, or wrong is right is wrong and wrong is right and nothing is nothing. And if it confuses us, then secularism said, oh, thank God we're winning. Because as Father Stan pointed out so eloquently yesterday, that sick, that confusion is the problem at the world at the moment. Through the messages of Father Gobi, also the same thing, doctrinal confusion in the church, that is a problem. Our civilization has become confused and directionless, bewildered and sucked in by this gigantic lie. And just as it tries to dismantle the great commandment of loving God with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, and with all our strength, it then says, forget about loving your neighbor as yourself. In place of love of God and of love of neighbor, Secularism offers us only a false God, a false love, a false self, a self-centeredness that is self-indulgent. Father Stan used the word last night, egoism. That's what it offers the world. St. Paul aptly described this in his letter to the Galatians. When self-indulgence is at work, St. Paul says, the results are obvious. Sexual vice, have we got that? Impurity, have we got that? Sensuality, have we got that in society? The worship of false gods and sorcery, I think they're present too. Antagonisms and rivalries, jealousy, bad temper and quarrels, disagreements, factions and malice, drunkenness, orgies and all such things. Unfortunately, too much of what is happening in our present civilization falls under this umbrella of self-indulgent egoism. Our civilization is in this type of crisis, the Holy Father tells us, because it forgets and distances God. And so it's in this context that we come back 
to Mary most holy, the highly favoured daughter of the Father, as the antidote to secularism, because she is the perfect model of love towards God and neighbour, and if we can only put ourselves under her protection, under her care and her guidance, then we'll head in the right direction. It's a very simple divine genius that works to overcome this very complicated and complex pervasive disease of secularism with a simple woman of faith. We know that nearly 2,000 years ago, or maybe 2,000 years ago, already that the Father gave a unique mission to Mary, that of giving the world the long-awaited Saviour. We know that he has continued to send her. Just a quick review of some of her visitations of the world in recent centuries, we'll see that God is always one step ahead of the snake, always ready with the antidote as the snake is rearing up to bite. Just as the church in the old world was to be shaken to its very foundations by the convulsive Protestant Reformation in the first part of the 20th of the 16th century, Mary was sent to Don Diego in 1521 in Guadalupe in the New World with the message of peace, not only for the Mexicans and Mexico, but for the whole world. Coincidence, as mayhem was beginning in Europe, just as the Age of Enlightenment began to totally dismantle the existence of the supernatural in the 19th century, Mary was sent this time to Bernadette to make of Lourdes a permanent miracle in face of those who would say there are no such things. And at the same time, to confirm the authority of the church's infallibility. For four years before that, in 1854, we know that Pope Pius IX pronounced the dogma of the Immaculate Conception and of papal infallibility. Four years later, in Lourdes, Mary says, I am the Immaculate Conception. And just as the Great War was ending, the war that was meant to end all wars, as it was ending in 1917, and atheistic communism was rising in Russia, Mary is sent again, this time to Fatima, with the message of repentance to the whole world. Prophecies of a second and more terrible world if we didn't at war and the spread of the Red Plague if we didn't repent and of course the call to consecrate the church and the world to her immaculate heart as the divine antidote for the snake bite of secularism. More recently, Mary was sent to Amsterdam with Our Lady of Nations and also to Akita in Japan to speak of the crisis of the church and the crisis of the world. We can trust these apparitions because the church says they are authentic. We know that there are many other reported apparitions of Our Lady at this time, all with similar messages. Magigori is there to the hearts of many of us We've, we've felt its effects. This whole convention in many ways has grown out of the effect of Magigoria in the lives of people. We've seen its good fruits, we've seen the conversions, and we await the church to approve or not. And so it is without hesitation that the Holy Father puts again before our eyes our Blessed Mother, as the perfect model of love towards him, towards God, and towards our neighbor, a neighbor, with that urgent and loving maternal message to all people, come home 
to your father's house, how will you do that? Listen to whatever Christ tells you. We know that loving God means learning daily to do the Father's will and to keep his commandments. If you love me, says Jesus, you'll keep my word and my Father will love you and I will love you and we will come and make our home with you. And another time he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these others do? And Peter said, you know everything. You know I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. And we have the successor of Peter feeding the sheep. Feeding us with the truth that we are to turn our eyes to Mary, most holy, the highly favoured daughter of the Father, to find in her and through her and with her the perfect foil to the challenge of secularism and to facilitate genuine interfaith dialogue because we know who is behind secularism. We know who is behind church unity and we know who has the authority to stand on the head of the snake. In Mary Most Holy, we encounter the pure essence of being fully human, of being fully alive in the Holy Spirit, of being filled with grace and therefore fully a child of God. She is the most highly favoured daughter because she is full of grace. We encounter in Mary her origins, her life of faith, her use of human freedom, the unalloyed loving response of God to God and neighbour. Because love of God and love of neighbour is the goal of Christian life. And that is why the Holy Father says, as we end the 20th century, the second millennium, and look into the third millennium, we must refocus our attention and let Mary do that for us on the very core, the very goal of Christian living. Love of God and love of neighbour. Everything else is a means to that end. Everything else is a means to that end of loving God and loving neighbour because that is holiness. That is true holiness. That is the life within the Father's house. Each time I baptize a baby, I'm struck by the simple clarity of the liturgical text that we use. For right there at the start of the ceremony of baptism, the church is very upfront with parents. They're left in no misunderstanding as to what the church and what Christ through the church is calling them to do. For we say to them, you have asked to have your child baptized. In doing so, you are accepting the responsibility of training this child of yours, in the practice of the faith. It will be your duty to bring this child up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and our neighbour. That phrase again, by loving God and our neighbour. There, at the very heart of Christian, at the very beginning of Christian initiation, it is very plainly spelt out what we are entering into. We're entering into a, a lifelong process which will teach us in this world to love God and our neighbour 
so that we can continue that forever because that is the life of God, love. What does this mean in practice? There is a lie abroad. There is a falsehood in the heart of our civilization, the Holy Father tells us. It is secularism. It is false religion. The antidote is truth. Mary Most Holy, the highly favored daughter of the Father, is saying to us, listen to my son, do whatever he tells you, for he is the truth. Mary's unique mission is to present the truth to the world. She did this and responded to this 2,000 years ago. She has always done it. She is doing it now. She will always do one thing, and that is to present the world to her son and present her son to the world. That is her mission. And in doing so, she presents truth. And she says to us, do whatever he tells you. Jesus says to us, if you make my word your home, you will be my disciples. You will come to know the truth and the truth will set you free. And what does Jesus tell us? Make my word your home. What is the life of that home? The life of the Father's house? Love of God and love of neighbor. Love God with your whole heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole of the law and the prophets, Christ says. And in doing so, he summarizes 43 books of the Old Testament and two commandments very easy to remember the whole of the Old Testament. <laughs> Love God and neighbor. He then goes on to give us another helping hand by summarizing the 27 books of the New Testament in the New Commandment, Love one another as I have loved you. In those three statements, the whole of the Bible is summarized. And who says so? <laughs> he who is the word of God. Then we have the vicar of Christ. He has also the unique mission of Peter to feed the sheep, to feed the flock in this time. He says that the church must commit itself to establish a civilization of love in order to counter the civilization of secularism. He's called constantly for a new evangelization. And in quoting his his predecessor, Pope Paul VI, he says, this must be done more by deeds, by way of life, than by words. We must live this love and back it up with words, not just simply talk about it. And then finally, there is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. He is sent by the Father and the Son to turn our, the minds and the hearts of the church and of the world back to Christ. I remember as a boy hearing the, the prayer being prayed in our parish community, the prayer of Pope John the Twenty-Third, praying for a new Pentecost, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we are part of that outpouring because God has answered that call. When the kingdom of God came into the world 2,000 years ago, God used four persons, the Holy Spirit, Mary Most Holy, the Word Incarnate, and Peter. As the kingdom of God meets the challenge of secularism and false religion and attempts to lead the whole world into the third millennium of Christianity, God continues to use those same four persons, those same four people, the Holy Spirit, Mary Most Holy, his highly favored daughter, the Word incarnate, Jesus Christ, her son, 
and Pope John Paul II the only legitimate successor of St. Peter in our own time. And so you can see we're in very good hands, in spite of what's going on around about us. The words of Jesus come to us, there's nothing to be afraid, little flock, I'm with you. Secularism must be challenged and defeated, and it will be. And there must only be one shepherd and one flock, and there will be, because the redemption team is still at work. They are still at work and they are still at full power. But they need us to listen and to work with them. And the redemption team is constantly sending in our own time and presenting Mary, most holy, the highly favoured daughter of the Father, as the mother to speak to us, the message for our time. Do whatever he tells you. And Jesus says, love God and your neighbour. Thanks very much.